Hi, everyone. I'm here with uh, Dr. S Dr. Sam Adolfotoe, uh, a spine surgeon uh, from Dubai and also chairman of uh, AO Spine in that region. He has been um, graciously kind enough to spend a little bit of time with us this morning to share what's happening in Dubai. Uh, welcome, Sam. Uh, welcome. Uh, nice uh, talking to you, uh, Dr. Bandari, and thank you for the kind invitation. Pleasure being with you. Well, great. Thank you uh, again for joining us. And what what can you speak to about the situation in Dubai? We've seen the world um, in various stages of either reopening or in many ways entering a lockdown, depending on where they are with the pandemic issue. Where is Dubai in all of this? Well, definitely, it's uh, it's an unusual situation for all of us around the world, and Dubai is no different from from the whole world. Um, we started uh, the lockdown from the COVID probably a couple of months ago, where the whole country was under total lockdown for uh, three weeks. Uh, everyone stayed home. Uh, I believe uh, the people of Dubai at this point, at that point, were really cooperative with the government and the follow the instructions on staying home and everything. And I think the government has implemented very uh, strong regulations when it comes to COVID as well. And that helped with having the number of the uh, patients under control in comparison uh, to different parts of the world as well. Um, as for our practice as uh, spine surgeons or as orthopedic surgeons uh, in general, it's definitely a unique situation for us because we were not allowed to go for any elective surgeries probably for the past three months unless it's an emergency or a semi-urgent surgery. Uh, but I believe it's definitely for the benefit of everyone and um, it's definitely a unique situation, but now we're getting to a better um, situation now where the country is starting to open up again. So let me just, if I could, ask a couple of more details that would help, uh, I think, our, a lot of our listeners understand. When you say elective surgery was, for the most part, canceled, what type was any elective surgery happening? Well, it, they were very specific about the uh, type of elective surgeries that you can run. So, for example, if you have a patient who, um, like neurosurgeries, were probably exempted from those. So, cancer surgeries, onco surgery, all of those stuff that go under the uh, title of urgent or emergent, not necessarily emergency, but still has some urgency to be operated. All of those surgeries were running on. Definitely deliveries when it comes to OB-GYN, all of those stuff that can't be stopped and has to be uh, operated anyways. As a spine surgeon, Sam, I would imagine there still would be um, a number of urgent procedures, whether it was a decompensation from a tumor or trauma that would have kept you fairly busy. Did you see a big change um, in your uh, urgent spine practice or, did, or in fact, did you see increases? Uh, we've seen differences of opinion around trauma being decreased around the world simply because people weren't on the streets anymore, so they weren't getting injured. But does the same apply for spine? Uh, it does, actually. So uh, as a matter of fact, the number of uh, emergency trauma is definitely much less than before. And that's something that we noticed over the past few weeks. Um, we are still probably, we're still probably running the same number of uh, emergency spine surgeries when it comes to uh, Coda Equina syndrome, uh, when it comes to tumor cases, those are probably running in the same way they used to be before COVID. Uh, but what's interesting is actually not just the surgeries, but the complaints of the patients coming to the clinic are a little bit different than before. So I'm starting to see younger population of back pain patients who are coming to my clinic now. You know, back pain is probably um, a disease that's affecting everyone, all the generations, all different ages. Yeah. But it's interesting that over the past few weeks, we have noticed that people who are in the second or third decade of their lives and they're coming to the clinic complaining of back pain, which is pre pretty unusual. And I have noticed that this is probably because of them staying home all the time, 
working from home, working on their laptops over their couches over there. So that's what, that was pretty interesting and different to the regular population that we usually see in our spine clinics. Oh, that's actually very interesting. What do you see as the future now? So um, is this uh, situation going to last in Dubai for months? Some countries are saying that they, are, they aren't expecting returning to normal for a year, at least over a year. What's your perspective on returning to pre-COVID uh, clinical practice? All right. So um, I can tell you here in Dubai, the country or in United Arab Emirates in general, the country mainly runs on business, right? It's business on different uh, aspects of life. And uh, I think what the government have done over the past few weeks that they started opening most of the business again back to normal. Uh, so now the lockdown is basically from 11 p.m. to 6 in the morning. And uh, in the working hours from 6 to 11, everything is running pretty normal. Okay. Malls are open, restaurants and cafes are open. Now, that definitely has an impact on our uh, practice as well, because still people, they do understand the fact that COVID is still running and that mm -hmm. we are probably going to be suffering from this for a long time. But the fact that the government has taken an implementation to open the businesses back, that gives people a little bit of confidence of getting out of home and going to the clinics, going to the hospital to be examined. And we noticed that once um, the lockdown hours were decreased, that the number of patients coming to our clinics are much higher than before, especially over the first week of the opening of the lockdown. We got like a 400 uh, a 400 percent increase in the number of patients coming to the clinic which was crazy um yeah so i think people are they have a good thing here is people have confidence in the decisions of the uh of their government which is right. which is great and they have good faith that the people around them are implementing the regulations run by the government as well so are, when you say things are opened up, does that mean gatherings again, large gatherings are allowed? I mean, the big challenge right now has been, you know, you may have seen what's happening um, in North America or heard of what's happening in North America. There have been large, large demonstrations for a variety of political reasons as well. But, you know, there are thousands and thousands of people that were uh, coming together. That's led to some concern that there might be risk of more transmission of the virus. Likely it's going to happen. We, and likely it's going to happen in younger individuals because we're seeing that transmission happening as well. What's happening in Dubai regarding large gatherings? So large gatherings are still on hold, definitely. Okay. And, uh, basically, if you're going to a restaurant, you cannot be more than five sitting on one table. Uh, if you're a family of four, you cannot get on a single, in a single car to go to, oh, okay. uh, go to a mall to go for an outing or something like that. Um, maximum of three persons per car. Uh, they are pretty strict with those regulations. Um, as you mentioned, uh, what's happening in America right now, which is pretty unfortunate actually, because not just for the political side of it, but actually be for the health side of it as well, with yeah. the COVID and everything. Uh, yeah, we'll definitely see more people getting infected over the coming uh, few weeks. Uh, and I think it's something that at this point, I believe that we have to accept and to deal with, uh, to try to avoid it as much as we can, but we need to understand that it is happening and that there is a certain percentage of our population that's going to be impacted with COVID. And when you when you talk to your patients, what, what is their current concern? I mean, you know, things were very heightened against COVID concern very early on, um, depending on where you are in the phase of infections rising or, or reopening, that changes. What are the primary concerns of your patients right now or the community? Is COVID still the biggest cause of concern or are they now moving beyond it a little bit? Um, well, COVID is still the elephant in the room, right? Whenever sure. you're talking to um, a patient or something or you're proposing a surgery to one of your patients, their biggest concerns is, well, I don't want to go to the hospital because if I go over there, I think I'm going to get infected. Right. And my answer to them is usually, well, if there is an infected person in the hospital, at least you know that this is a guy who has COVID and you're avoiding getting in contact with him. Unlike walking into a mall where probably 
few people around you are infected with COVID and you have a higher chance of getting infect infection over there. Um, the other thing as well is, um, so now the hostels were not making a lot of money over the past few weeks with all the lockdown and the elective surgeries were on hold and stuff, but they were making good money from admitting COVID patients as well. Right, so the government is paying directly to the private practice, to the private hostels, to get uh, the COVID patients admitted over there, and that's direct payments. instead of waiting for the insurance companies to to pay for the regular patient, the regular surgeries. So there was this uh, period of time, probably around a month ago, where patients were really skeptical and really afraid to go to hostels because there was this understanding that this is a COVID. Uh -huh. hospital. Yeah. But I think patients now they have a better understanding. Every single person probably has a person in his family who got infected with COVID or a relative or a friend. So I think the fear of COVID is going to go down over time. It's not going to be as great as it is in the um, mean in the right time or the or the past few weeks. And do you see yourself traveling at all? I think one of the biggest issues we've seen is um, in most countries that have been very successful <clears throat> within the country, <clears throat> or also internationally, as stop travel. Um, you know, don't let other cases come in from other places. If you think about how coronavirus spread, there was an incident case, and it was travel. That's what led it to the massive, you know, um, pandemic that it became very quickly. I think we've learned from that. What's your take Absolutely. right now on resuming either travel within the UAE or broadly, even internationally? Uh, so D Dubai actually has a very uh, unique situation is that, uh, you know, Dubai airport is probably the biggest international airport in the world and it's a transit to most of the uh, flights to the Far East and then to, to North America and South America as well, with Emirates being one of the largest companies in the world. But um, And I think uh, so far we don't have any... Um, plans on, they started opening the airports a little bit to a few destinations, so like 14 or 16 destinations, but they're not rushing things. They're going very slow. They're, um, you know, every day we have different data from the day before. Right. And I think they're very, that's one of the things that we learned with COVID as well, and that they're very slow taking decisions on opening the airport. But I believe traveling is going to be different from the, traveling that we used to be in before the pre in the pre-COVID era. Um, they are preparing the airports with all the sanitizers, um, right. checking temperature, all of those stuff. Uh, but I don't think that will be, as you said, will not be back to normal, I guess, not before a year from now. Or as I Dr. Fauci said, the new normal, not just normal. The, the new normal, the new normal. You know, and the thing is, it's interesting. Um, it almost appears that well, airlines are having to re or airplanes are having to reorganize their seating in a way that you can only have a certain number of people quote, physically distanced at a certain. I don't know if they're removing the center seat. Some airlines are saying we've just removed our center seat and all these you know additional costs. It's an inevitability that the cost of flying is going to double what it used to be, which suddenly means flying will become a luxury of those who have and definitely not an opportunity for those who have not. Whereas before, you know, there was enough of, um, there's enough balance in the system. Do you fear that that's also going to happen um, with respect I, to now? Yeah, in Dubai, I suspect, you know, that there's that there's a lot of people who have the ability to travel and fly, but in many parts of the world, it may become too cost prohibitive because they're gonna have to, half the number of people in a plane means double the price if they wanna keep that plane flying, it's at least, one of the basic mathematical balances you have to think about. Absolutely, and uh, right, if you think about mathematically, and, you, and you're uh, well, probably one of the biggest researchers yourself, <laughs> so that's definitely simple math means uh, definitely more money to get a seat on a, on a flight, right? Um, and it's, it's pretty challenging. I mean, we don't know what the consumer behavior is gonna be after COVID, to be honest with you. It's not just that they're gonna get more expensive, I think, uh, consumers now understand that they are not their way of spending money is a little even in a, in a country like the UAE where the right. the per capita is is high, but right. uh, people are very careful with spending money on unnecessary 
stuff because a couple of months ago they were under the impression that they will be fighting over toilet paper right so in so who knows in the future if they're going to need that money for another emergency um it's going to be very challenging for the companies as well including the including the airlines because they want to promote and at the same time they want to cut to they have very high costs to run those flights um it's going to be a very tricky situation yeah. We also want to add something that not just with the flights and everything, like in our courses in Aospine or in Aotrauma, when we prepare such courses, now that users or members are used to attending free webinars, right? Right, right. We get everything for free now. I wonder if we do courses after COVID and then we charge uh, members or, or for, a, for a category course like $2,000, for example. Will members be able to pay for that, or they just got used to attending free uh, webinars online and free activities online? So it's definitely something that needs to be studied after we are over with this. And I think you're absolutely right. I mean, that's an important point that nobody knows, right, Sam? In that, um, as someone like yourself who's chairing, you know, a very large organization and trying to give educational courses, um, the way that these entities stayed healthy um, and survived was that we'd have a real desire for surgeons around the world to connect. They'd come in physically, they'd meet, um, and in part of the meeting, the social interaction is part of the value you know, of these courses. When you put something online, while it's much, much more uh, efficient for everybody, it isn't the same as being sitting and having a coffee or whatever, you know, maybe having a chat with somebody. And I think that's the difference. And the question is, there are groups trying to find ways in which they can use the online platform like we're talking and try to charge almost the same rates. And I've seen some groups charging the same types of rates for their courses online. Um, but defense of that is going to be very difficult. Why? Your point's well taken. For every course that you could pay for, you could find 20 more of the same topic that are free. And that's the marketplace that we're in. And it's, I think it's a new way in which we think as an organization. It's a new way in which you as a leader will have to be thinking. And I'm sure you're doing all of that. Um, but I can't thank you enough for taking, you know, a little bit of time out of your uh, day to give us some insights about Dubai, Sam. It's been really, really uh, enlightening and particularly important to see that in so many other areas, we're seeing a changing epidemiology of, you know, you know, injury, we're seeing a changing epidemiology of um, pain um, and, and all kinds of musculoskeletal disease simply because people have shifted the way they think or they move. Um, and that in itself is very interesting. So thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for the invitation and pleasure being with you.